Hello my bookish friends out there in booktube land and welcome to another episode of Tristan and the Classics with me sporting a new haircut. In this video we're going to take a look at the 20 most popular classics according to how often they've been bought. Which ones have you read? And stick around for the Easter egg in this video. In 20th place, we have Truman Capote's In Cold Blood. This is the book that gripped and rocked the American nation and put Truman Capote on the map. It, it's the investigation of a murder of a Kansas farmer, his wife and children, in 1959 by the young lads Perry Smith and Dick Hickok. Truman Capote, being a journalist, did hear some of the most famous investigative journalism ever produced, but also broke the journalistic wall by inserting himself into the piece. And what was so worrying about this book and what really captured everyone's imagination was the fact that although the killers were terrible, terrible people, they were so incredibly human. And that was quite worrying. In 19th place, we have Stoner by John Williams. It's called Stoner, a novel, but I think it'd be better be called Stoner, a life. Because in this book, we have the story of the everyman, William Stoner, who at 19 goes to university to study agriculture um, because he wants to help out on his father's farm and, and develop it, but he gets into a different topic instead. He later becomes a teacher at the university he makes all sorts of strange decisions, not strange, but ordinary decisions and bad decisions in his very ordinary and unremarkable life. And that may sound like it's boring, but what it is, it champions, it brings back to mind that in this world, there are not just the great and the glorious, but the majority of the world are people just moving through it. And this is told with such quiet force with such gentleness of touch and intensity of compassion from the narrator to William Stoner, that it's quite striking. I think what made this suddenly popular is that the Sunday Times quote was put on the front of it, calling it the greatest novel you've never read. Well, that's guaranteed to pique curiosity, isn't it? In 18th place is Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. You're bound to have heard of this one. Written in 1957, it has got enduring popularity, but a resurgence, particularly due to the fervent fermenting discontent in politics at the moment. So in this book, you have, is it Dagny and Hank? I can't remember their surnames. I believe they're steel magnates, if I remember rightly. And their business is constantly being looted. And the government in America is constantly putting more burdensome regulations and restrictions on free enterprise. Then they meet a mysterious character called John Galt, who is trying to get all industrialists, all business people to just go on strike um, because the looters are just taking everything. Now, what Ayn Rand is really making, passing comment on here is fascism, socialism, communism to a caricatured extent. Um, and the difficulties it imposes on wealth and how it promotes um, nefarious activities by the less industrious in the population. Now, whether you agree with it or not, it certainly is a staple of political literature, especially in the West. So that's number 18, Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. In 17th place is that remarkable book, Slaughterhouse Five by Kurt Vonnegut, a book which is pretty impossible to summarize, but I'll give it a try. So, Kurt Vonnegut's main character in this book is Billy Pilgrim, and he becomes unstuck from time, which means the book moves in a sequence of flashbacks and flash forwards in a non-linear way. <clears throat> in this book, it's said that Vonnegut was trying to come to terms with his own experiences of being in the war and the, the fallout of actually war on your attitude. But Billy Pilgrim, he's you, you see him in a small town in New York while the war's on. Um, he doesn't want to fight, but then he's flashed forward into Luxembourg during the war where he's fighting and is captured by the Germans. Um, there's incidents between him and another character who's quite a horrible, aggressive person. Is it John Weary? I think it is. And then he's flashed forward again where they are captives inside a hut or a building, a slaughterhouse uh, called Slaughterhouse Fünf, which is five in German, so hence the title of the book. And the, the bombing of Dresden is taking place, that firestorm moment in the war, which was so dramatic. The book 
shows the effect both morally, philosophically, and PTSD, which didn't have a name back then when it was written in 1969. Overall, a very, very extraordinary piece of writing, but it was something Vonnegut always wanted to write, but took him, I think he said it took him like 20 years to write it because he wasn't accomplished enough a writer to pull it off the way he wanted to. But if it's a, if it's something you, if it's a book you want to read to have thought provoking ideas, then this is the one. It also doesn't glorify war one bit. I just want to interrupt to say that if you are into the classics or you're trying to get into them and want to get more out of them, then you may want to consider joining my Patreon. I'll put the link down below because we have a community there that is growing and getting more engaged who are all interested in really pulling the classics apart and finding the most succulent pieces to chew upon, the things that give birth to thought and recognizing ourselves in the old classics, the timeless things that make us human. If you're interested in that, why not pop over and join the Patreon? Right, back to our list. In 16th place is the dystopian novel Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury, in which we're introduced to Guy Montag, the fireman, but not a fireman who puts fires out, rather he's a man who goes around burning books on behalf of the government. Because books are dangerous, books give people ideas, and the government has supplied every need of its populace with games and bread, as the Romans would say. Um, they just give them entertainment, keep them in a stupor of imbecility, as it were. But Guy Montag bumps into a young girl early in the book, and there's something about the questions she asks. It's just that she's got questions, and we're in a world with no books, which means no written thoughts, where people don't question anything. Slowly, Guy Montag is tempted to look at some of the books that he's actually sent to burn. But will he be detected? What will his fate hold? It's quite a disturbing idea and somewhat true about our society. Um, I won't give you my opinion of it, that's for another video. In 15th play comes the novel by Oscar Wilde, The Picture of Dorian Gray. Have you read this? This book is quite interesting because you have Dorian Gray, who is very prominent in society, a beautifully good-looking young man, and he meets Lord Henry Wotton, who is a hedonist um, and espouses the idea of just having beautiful things and pleasure. Wotton tells Dorian Gray, isn't it sad that your beautiful face will age, whereas the painting that is being made of him by an artist friend will forever remain young? And then there is an almost Faustian kind of uh, event where Dorian is allowed to keep his youth permanently, but the age and his behaviours will show their effect on the painting. So the story goes. Fascinating, brilliantly well written. I love Lord Henry Wotton's way of talking. He's very convincing. But more importantly, this is almost to me where Oscar Wilde looks back and reflects on his own life, which was very much to do with art and beauty and engaging in every pleasure you could. And actually his musings on what that actually turns a person into. There is much more to this book than meets the eye, much more than the brilliant writing that goes into it. In 14th place is the great and renowned The Lord of the Rings, a book which continues to divide people whether they love it or hate it, and is broken up into the classic three parts of The Fellowship of the Ring, The Two Towers, and The Return of the King. So, Sauron is the main antagonist who broods in the background, who has command over the whole of the world because he made a ring in the dark past which would command all the others. The rings of power given to the men, the dwarves and the elves. And we have from the Hobbit, from the Shire, the Hobbit, Frodo and Sam and Merry and Pippin who end up going on this quest as unlikely heroes. We're joined by the famous Aragorn of, of the men and you've got Legolas of the elves and you've got Gimli of the the dwarves and the attempt to be able to 
take Sauron's single ring of power and throw it into the fires on Mount Doom. That's the great thing. It's a high work of fantasy. You've probably seen the films, but it still divides people today. Some say it's an awful book. Some say it's not greatly written. Others think it's a masterpiece. Tolkien himself created a language, a runic language out of this. The book is full of 60 poems that's been written. What you can say about this book is maybe no other has been as good at world building and at capturing the imagination of generation after generation after generation of fantasy readers. Have you read it? In 13th place is The Stranger by Albert Camus. This is a book I've not actually read and really keep meaning to get around to. Camus was a philosopher writer and this book considers existentialism and absurdism. Our main character, the protagonist, is um, Merceau. And at the beginning of the book, his mother has died and he goes to the funeral, but he expresses no emotion. He drinks white coffee instead of black coffee, which is the done thing at a funeral. The next day, he's met up with a woman who asks if she wants, if he wants to go and watch a program, a TV program or a film, um, and then go back to hers. And a relationship starts, all this right after his mother has died. He then meets a character called Raymond. Raymond will feature prominently through this because Raymond asks Merceau to do various things, which are not only questionable, but wrong. However, Camus' character, Merceau, he doesn't seem to feel anything. If, if people want him to do something, he'll do it. And so the story goes with various um, episodes where he just goes along with things until he ends up in prison and then begins to reflect on his behavior and come to conclusions about the nature of things. Um, and his desire for how everything should wrap up in some kind of denouement is supposedly quite interesting. So it is an existential um, book. It's to question the way we live, the philosophy or worldview of um, the world around us, the reality of things around us. Have you read The Stranger? Would you recommend it? Our twelfth book on the list is Lolita by Vladimir Nabokov. This is a book I have not read and I do not ever see myself reading it because of its, its topic. The main character, Humbert Humbert, or Humbert Humbert, I don't know how you pronounce it, is a hebophile. So he is um, attracted to pubescent girls. And this happens because of an incident in his life early on when he's young. He has a friend who he loves and she dies. And so he becomes fixated on her as the ideal girl for him. And so later on, when he meets Dolores, whom he calls Lolita, she is the ideal nymphette, as he calls, calls them. He moves into her mother's house, and of course, he takes a diary about, you know, how much he likes her and dislikes her mother. And then eventually this builds up to a, an inevitable conclusion, and so on and so forth. Some people say the writing in this book is absolutely fantastic. For me personally, and I'm not judging, but I don't care how good the writing is, I don't want to go down the route of that topic because for me, I always invest in a protagonist and see things through their eyes and that is something I don't want to see through. But nonetheless, it is a very critically acclaimed book. The 11th book on our list is the book that broke all books and some say is the greatest work of literature ever written. It is James Joyce's Ulysses, uh, a whopper of a book and yet the whole thing takes place in just one day. I would go so far as to guess that this is the most unread book purchase in the world because it's quite a demanding read. Some people absolutely love it. It's defeated me several times, not because um, it's not interesting, or because it doesn't have any oomph in it, because it has plenty of that, it has great writing, but it's very demanding because Joyce plays around with language a lot in this. There are sections which have no punctuation. There are sections which are stream of consciousness at another level. Others are interrupted by headlines all the way through. The main two characters in this are Stephen Daedalus and Leopold Bloom, different sides of the city of Dublin on the same day. And we follow their activities through the day, from an early conversation in the morning between Stephen and someone he doesn't like, um, and how his decision, I'm not going to make uh, complete that arrangement that I said I would go to later on, um, and then Leopold Bloom and his activities and thoughts. 
you notice that all the way through this in real life, we don't hold on to a single line of thought through the day, which is what all publications do, all novels do. What he tries to capture is reality. Also, the, the interweaving of lives as Leopold and Stephen come close to each other but keep missing each other, although later on they do eventually meet up. And then all of the random thoughts that our mind goes to through the day, whether it is we see someone that's attractive and our response to that, um, any guilty thoughts. There's even a section where... Joyce recapitulates the history of the English language through Stephen, who is a scholar, where he sort of riffs off Anglo-Saxon chronicles, then Mallory, then the Bible, like the King James Bible, and other great works, uh, writers like Bunyan and Pepys and Defoe and Carlyle and Gibbon. It's a very much an experimental work in a lot of respects. But as T.S. Eliot said, it's not fut it's not Joyce's fault if future generations don't like it or understand it. A man of genius is judged by his peers. So, you know, if you have you ever read this book? There are clubs that study this book, like, monthly, all their life. Um, it is quite profound in places, but it's not an easy read, in my opinion. We are now in the top 10 of the most popular classics, according to a list built up by the Book Depository. But before we go into them, here's the Easter egg in this video. Can you let me know, if it would be helpful to you, if you've ever wanted to start a booktube channel yourself and share your passion for books, but you're not sure how to go about it and you would like um, maybe some of my input on how to start and film a booktube channel and ideas to help it grow if you want to get into that. Please let me know in the comments um, if that's something you'd be interested in and I'll see what I can do to help out. So, back to our top 10 most popular classics. In 10th place is the incredible and marvellous and beautiful Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy. This book is just superb. Yes, it's about 900 pages long, depending on the size of the type you're reading. It could be bigger or smaller. But what a book. Um, in this, we have the story of Anna Karenina, Count Vronsky, and Levin. It's not a love triangle. Anna Karenina is married to a boring guy who is almost, who is very unfeeling as well, but she falls for the charming Count Vronsky, who also falls for Anna Karenina on one of the most sumptuous meetings in a train carriage you are going to read. It's so short and yet so, oh, magnetic. Um... And then we get to see the effects of an illicit relationship. We'll get to see the hypocrisy and cant of high society. We see the glitter and the ennui of being in the upper class and all of its strata of names and titles. Also, we see the difference between the countryside and natural living compared to the city and the burgeoning industrialization of the world. Because Levin, he is, a, he is also a noble, but he wants to improve the lives of the serfs. He wants to help the peasants. He wants to um, be able to run farms more effectively. In this book, you have some of the best descriptive passages. There is one that there is two scenes in this book which forever stay with me and are just a charm, a lyrical haunting in my mind. Uh, the, the scene where they scythe in the harvest, all the peasants with Levin working along with them into the twilight. This book, as some have said, is just, you know, she's just a silly old girl who gets attracted to men. She's drippy. She is not. That's not what this book is about. Someone said this is um, Madame Bovary badly done. Nonsense. That's the most surface reading of a book I've ever heard. This book was taken a little bit from Tolstoy's real life relating to his sister and the sheer inward feelings, the, the, the grasping hold of, of the turmoil and the trouble and the desires and the goals that he captures is just amazing. It also has one of the best endings you will ever read. It will let, it will stay with you forever. So that was number 10, Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy. Just to say, if you actually look for the book depositories list that I'm reading from, 
You'll find in 10th place The Essex Serv uh, Serpent by Sarah Parry, but that was written in 2016, and so um, I don't really class that as being a classic. It hasn't endured long enough. Now, so, carrying on, in 9th place, is Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck. Ah, uh, I remember the first time I read this. It was so... It was coloured amber in my mind, the capturing of the sun at this time. We follow the two itinerant workers, uh, George and Lenny, through about 120 pages of a very simple story. They don't belong anywhere. It's the depressive 1930s of America. And you just see them going along trying to work on ranches in order to make a bit of money to be able to eat. And of course, Lenny is quite simple minded and George looks after him until an incident happens in which they get into trouble, at least Lenny does. And it's how George cares for him and how Lenny has such a soft hearted soul um, and a simple outlook on life, but just how hard life can be and how brutally uncompassionate the world can be as well to people who don't have a home, so to say. I'd highly recommend that you look at Of Mice and Men. In eighth place is Norma Mailer's play, The Crucible, which sets itself in the time of the Salem witch trials in Massachusetts. And in this, we, we start with the Reverend Samuel Paris in an attic with his young daughter, who's about 10, I think, Betty. And she's passed out. She's been unconscious. And he had found her and some other girls and um, a slave doing, dancing naked in the woods, doing some kind of pagan rite. And so starts the beginning of the investigation into whether something was witchcraft and the girls having their plan to keep silent, but how it begins to spread and how a guy who's a specialist in demonology and like an exorcist comes along. And there's a, a lesson in what isolation does and what overly strict um, puritanical strictures do to a society and also the dark desires of people and the petty feuds that you have around. That's part of Norman Mailer's play sort of encapsulating the Salem Witch Trials. In seventh place is the renowned The Lord of the Flies by William Golding. Um, a tremendous book. William Golding said he wanted to imagine sort of Robinson Crusoe, but if you used youngsters, and what kind of society would they build? He tried to be as real as possible rather than just like a boy's own adventure. In this, you have your main characters. So Ralph is one of them, and you've got Piggy, and what's the guy who's Jack, I think his name is, and Roger. There's quite a number of boys, and they start off forming their society based on whoever holds the conch shell gets the right to speak. We have a, a democratic society originally, but there is that push for power inside the group and differing ideas and how youngsters respond to it with the team splitting up into two tribes and one of them being more violent and aggressive in their ways or also the un the releasing of inner natures on a society that's not controlled and in a microcosm you get to investigate really human society as a whole if you were to take away certain um, balances, checks and measures in society and the way it horrifyingly plays its way out and the role of almost religion being developed within a society like that as well until it comes to its grand climax. Lord of the Flies, of course, in Hebrew, Beelzebub, and that's no accident that that's there. And there's a scene which you understand gives birth to this title. So that's number seven, Lord of the Flies by William Golding. In sixth place is a somewhat controversial pick because the book itself was released in 2015, but it was written a long time before by a classic author, which is Harper Lee, the author of To Kill a Mockingbird. And some say that Harper Lee never wanted this book published. She didn't think it was sufficient enough to what she wanted it to be. However, here it is. It's called To Kill a Watchman. And we find Scout from the original To Kill a Mockingbird returning home at the age of 26 to see her father Atticus and her uncle Jack. Um, her brother Jem is dead by this time. The story revolves around the civil rights movement in the South. I think the Supreme Court of Brown versus the Board of Education comes up into this. And the need for reform, but also 
the balance against the speed of legis uh, legisture change. Now, she finds a pamphlet among her dad's um, items called the Black Plague. And it's to do with the fact that the black population now have cars, some say, but they don't have any insurance or license to drive them. And there is actually an accident in which um, a black driver kills or a group of black men in the car run down someone and kill them. Then she follows her father and finds him attending a place where there's someone giving a racist speech. And of course, if you've read To Kill a Mockingbird, you can imagine how this shocks Scout. And so the story progresses. I'm not going to tell you how it all works out. You would have to read it. In fifth place is Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger. Now, this book, obviously, you probably know it's famous. Many of you, probably thousands of you, have actually gone through this at school. We've got the protagonist, Holden Caulfield. This takes place over a, a very short time period. He is expelled from Pensy Preparatory Academy. And it's not so much a coming of age story as it is an awakening to the world of adults. Because being expelled, he then heads out into New York where he gets himself a room and he experiences various aspects of his emotions and his urges and how that interacts with adults. Um, he helps a friend write uh, an English piece. Um, but he finds out that this friend is going out with a girl he had an infatuation with and they get into a fight. You know, it's that, that repressed energies that were in the academy is now coming out. Um, his awakening recognition of his own feelings towards girls, a sort of sexual awakening, um, and the issues that that gets him involved with. Just becoming interested in the world around him, understanding his parents' disposition and attitudes. And then it has an interesting ending, which can be looked at in multiple kinds of ways. It can be looked at as quite optimistic. It can be looked at apathetically. Some can even find a negative in it. But this book has spoken to millions of teenagers and sells about one million copies a year. I believe this is on the list, like a few of the others in the top 10, because it's studied in schools. In the 80s, this was actually the most banned book in the United States, and at the same time, the second most um, used book in school. So a part, a part of the syllabus, which is a bit confusing. But that's it, Catcher in the Rye. And I just want to say, like I said, um, you think of Lord of the Flies, you think of, of Mice and Men, you think of The Crucible and this. I think the reason they're so high is because they are used in school as study materials. And that's why I think um, from 20 to 10 on this list are actually the more the ones that people choose to buy of, as the most popular classics. Our fourth book is a book that has also gone missing from my shelf somehow, and it is Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. Have you read this dystopian and somewhat prophetic novel? In the story, we are in London in the year 632 AF, that is after Ford, so the modernization has started a new world. This would be equivalent to like hundreds of years from now in the future. And our main character, Bernard, is working in the hatcheries. Now, the hatcheries is where children are born and raised rather than using the natural way of getting babies. Also, the world is sorted into castes. People are worked out into the correct place that they should work uh, according to how uh, the interests they have and the skills they have. Um, it's quite terrifying in the sense that at an epic, at ultra end of a scale, that is what equity of outcome would look like because you're forced to be in one certain area rather than choose yourself. Everyone is kept happy though with the, by the government by the use of a drug called Soma, which just keeps them happy. Soma meaning sleep or sedate. Bernard does not like the way this world works. He thinks it's wrong. And in the story, he ends up leaving the free state as it's called to where there are native peoples in another area called the Pueblo, Ple Pueblonians, I believe they're called, if I remember that rightly. And there he meets people who are born naturally, but where there's religion, where there's unhappiness, where there's violence. And he gets to meet different characters. Linda and John are the main ones. Now, John has learned to speak English and read English 
and this is where the title Brave New World comes from, he can only express himself in Shakespearean ways, and he wants to see the brave new world that is this London in, in, in the state where Bernard's come from. And so he goes back there and we get his experiences, experiencing the society structured like that, almost the trying to perfect society and what actual effect it has on someone who has come from a world that is more natural. Um, that's just a vague outline of the book. If you haven't read it, you really should try and read it. In third place is another book that is studied quite a lot at schools, but it's a brilliant book nonetheless, and that is To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. Shoot as many blue jays as you want, but remember it is a sin to shoot a mockingbird, or to kill a mockingbird, and that's where the title comes from. It's something that's said to Jem and Scout. So our story has the very famous lawyer Atticus Finch, but it follows through the eyes of Jem and Scout, particularly Scout, the two children of Atticus. He is representing a black man who has been accused of raping a white girl. Jem and Scout both see the racism of their community, the, the glibness of attitudes in the community towards people of colour, and the trust of someone purely because of the colour of their skin when the woman who's been accused, she's, you know, trailer trash for argument's sake, and no one would respect her normally, but because she's white and the accused is black, then the town side with her. Now Atticus takes Scout through understanding fairness and justice. Some people have criticised Atticus in this, but that's another story. But she also has the man next door who is like a bogeyman because you never see him and they're scared of him. And it's almost like Harper Lee, in fact she is, saying that that's how people of different colours often see each other, the bogeyman. Um, when actually if you just get to know them, they're perfectly fine. Uh, a remarkable book on the enduring topic of race, um, discrimination and rivalry. The book that made it to second place in the list of most popular classics that I purchased might surprise you. It is Animal Farm by George Orwell. So Animal Farm is the allegorical tale of the Soviet Union, of communism and its worst possible outcomes. Orwell was always interested in authoritarianism, in the overreach of government meddling in the lives of the common people. In this book, we have the animals who overthrow the farmer of a, a particular farm and change the name to Animal Farm. The pigs are the most intelligent and they lay out some certain um, uh, edict or rules or ideas which the animals all think are great. Chief amongst them is all animals are equal. But we see how power will always be grasped by certain ones, and particularly through influencing the young. We see a power dynamic between two of the pigs as they have different ideas of how to run it. We see the simplicity of the public in the makeup of the sheep who just bleat out slogans repeatedly, something you still see on the streets of most cities today, rather than reason, just a slogan to repeat. We see some who expend all their energy, box of the horse, uh, for working for the regime, but how we ironically can see that he's working himself into the ground for a bunch of tyrants. Um, and then there's the most famous phrase, as the pigs gain all the power, all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. Do you know what happens to the pigs at the end of this book? If you haven't read it, you won't. Um, it is actually a thoroughly entertaining book, um, or interesting book. It's about 100 pages long, and if you want to get a free audio narration of this, on my channel you can find me audio narrate this book. Although I will apologise, I did it quite quickly, and uh, not all of it's done brilliantly to be fair, but if you just want to listen to it for free, then by all means go and watch my video. I'll put the link down below. So we're at number one in the list of the most popular classics today, and it is, no surprise really, The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. I do love the cover of this one. Um, it's part of a whole set that looks like this. So The Great Gatsby, of course, Jay Gatsby, as played by Leonardo DiCaprio in the film, we see the story of his love for Daisy, 
um, but she's already married and we get a bit of the backstory of how he used to like Daisy, how he went to war, but somehow he's become very, very wealthy and he throws all these glitz and glamour parties in the hope that Daisy will turn up. The whole story is told by the somewhat insipid, boring character, Nick Carraway. But that gives a beautiful distance for us to analyze the story through. We get the idea of the American dream. We get the idea of um, American materialism and commercialism going on. But more than that, we get an insight into the human nature of various people um, who are stuck on an ideal, stuck with a dream they cannot let go of stuck with an end that they will not refuse to accept cannot be achieved. The way this book ends, absolutely brilliant. Some of the, one of the best paragraphs of ending, but even before that last paragraph, it's got a comment about how the new world was discovered and how that's very similar to the way we feel about our plans for the future as well. But what we see here is how your ideal can be your ultimate undoing. The Harmatia, as as um, what's his what's his face, the philosopher Aristotle would have called it. So that is the most popular classic book today, going by purchases. It is The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. So those were the top ten most popular classics today. Which ones have you read? Not read? Would you like to know what the top 10 best sellers were from 2023? If you do, go over to my other channel, Tristan Talks Books, um, because there I talk about modern and contemporary and best selling works. And I've got a video going up on the top 10 best sellers of last year and maybe what that tells us about our modern culture. Last of all, if you want to learn about how to do a booktube channel yourself, please let me know down below and I'll consider making a video to help you on your way. Until the next time, I really wish you joy in whatever you read.